funny, you know, we all seem to be totally comfortable with using our mobile phones or watching our huge TVs or jumping on TikTok or wearing shoes, all of which are made in China. But the minute you start talking about Chinese made cars, the internet seems to get very upset. Like apparently Chinese made cars are just terrible. They'll fall apart. They're horrible to drive. You should never buy one. But is there any truth to these accusations? Like, now that there are plenty of MG HSs on the used market, should you seriously consider buying one? Let's find out. Now guys, this has come as a bit of a shock to me, honestly, but after talking to some of my non-car friends, there's a chance that you're thinking, hang on, what does an MG have to do with Chinese made cars? Because MG are English, aren't they? No. See, MG was once upon a time an English mark, but in the mid-2000s, Chinese company Nanjing acquired the brand, which in one way or another has gone on to become China's SAIC Motor Corp. And guys, SAIC are huge. They make millions and millions of cars every year including this one. Now, as a quick overview, the HS is MG's mid-sized and flagship SUV, and depending on the year, is available here in Australia across five trim specs, initially all using the same 1.5-litre engine mated to a seven-speed dual-clutch automatic, powering the front wheels. But in 2021, a pair of on-demand all-wheel drive versions arrived, both based on the higher spec variants and both featuring a more powerful two-litre engine mated to a six-speed dual-clutch. Plus in 2021, a 1.5 litre front wheel drive plug-in hybrid model joined the range, initially based on the top spec Essence, but a more affordable Excite variant arrived in 2022. Now obviously with all of that, there is so much more that we could go into, but that would get incredibly boring in video form. But if you do need all of those specific details, jump on Redriven.com and check out our awesome and completely free Redriven cheat sheets. Basically they're like the ultimate used MG HS buyer's guides. Okay, now looks wise, obviously it's no masterpiece in automotive design, but we're talking a very budget-friendly, medium-sized SUV here, quite possibly the most boring category of car there is, and it's fine. Now, you can see that MG have taken inspiration from a few other SUVs kind of in this category. The taillights have a definite Alfa Romeo Stelvio look about them, and the rear haunches kind of remind me of a Nissan Pathfinder, and overall, it kind of looks like a slightly underwhelming Mazda CX-5 tribute band. It's not as good as the real thing, but at least there's been a half decent attempt. Okay, so interior wise, design wise, it's quite nice in here. You can see that MG have pulled a lot of inspiration from European manufacturers. It has a bit of a European kind of feel about it. Even the materials used, some of them feel quite good, like the leather on the seats feels quite nice. This kind of Alcantara effect is nice. Everything has, like, everything you touch has a good level of squidge and feel to it. Although some other things don't feel quite as nice. They do feel a bit cheap, like some of the switch gear, these buttons, they just feel, it's like, almost like there's no hinge. It's almost like it's just your flexing plastic, which doesn't give you a whole lot of confidence when you're pushing it. Um, but look, overall, it, the ambiance of the interior, yeah, decent. Now, ergonomics-wise, some people have complained that you sit too high in this. Maybe they just weren't aware that you can adjust the seat height because I, I can't stand a seat that just feels too high. This feels good. There's a good amount of adjustability here, and like, it is an SUV. It's not a sports car. It feels fine. Now, even though these buttons do feel a little bit cheap and nasty, the indicator stalks and the windscreen wiper stalks feel... This is going to sound a bit wanky, but they, they feel European. They've got that kind of almost Mercedes kind of feel to them. They don't feel cheap and nasty at all. Now, as far as wear and tear goes, look, this is this owner's everyday driver. There are dogs in here, there are grandkids in here. It gets a hell of a workout. And wear and tear isn't too bad. Like, the steering wheel is starting to lose a bit of texture around here. Some of the stitching's kind of coming loose on the red stitching there. The shift selector, the MG logo is starting to disappear a little bit. Again, with manufacturers with these, like, black plastic bits and painted sections, these are sort of scratching up pretty easily already. One thing as well, this is like a design issue, we found that it like, there's a lot of nooks and crannies and they love attracting like dust and crumbs and life, so it, it can be a bit of a challenge to clean. Um, but yeah, wear and tear, considering how much work this car gets, it's okay. Now, practicality in the front, you've got excellent sized door bins, you've got a spot here, again, more nooks and crannies for collecting crumbs and bits of dried flesh. There's a spot here which fits the keys perfectly just there. Spot here for your phone and cables. The only thing is, 
depending on what phone you've got, once you kind of put chargers and stuff in there, there's not a lot of room left to close that for your phone. Little slidey trapdoor here for uh, cup holders and a, another spot perfectly sized for your phone just there. You've got more storage in here, pretty decent size glove box, spot for your sunglasses here or a pen and something else that just fell out, I'm not sure. Sorry, Bob. Uh, oh, oh, oh. There we go. Uh, nothing under the seats as such. And I think that's it. That's it for practicality up front. Now in the back seat, I'm exactly 50 centimeters taller than someone else that is very convincing at being English when they're not. Actor Peter Dinklage or Tyrion Lannister from Game of Thrones. This is in my driving position. And I'm super impressed. Heaps of foot room, heaps of knee room. It feels airy and spacious. This has a panoramic sunroof, that certainly helps, but even without that, it feels good. There's not a lot of like under thigh support. That's being super wanky and pretentious, but generally speaking, very comfortable back here. Now, wear and tear wires, again, in this particular car, as I mentioned, it gets used all the time. There are grandkids and dogs back here a lot. So there are a few little marks and scratches, but honestly, with a, with a solid detail, this had come up a treat. There's no like, it's not, I wouldn't say it's quality issues, it's just a bit, a bit dirty. Actually, you know what, like even this leather upholstery, considering the hell of a workout it gets, is wearing really well, I'm, like, I'm impressed. Now, practicality back here, this being a top spec car, you get air vents, you get USB ports down there, you've got your map pocket holders here, excellent door bins, you've got an armrest here with some very fancy looking fake brushed aluminium look with the world's slowest opening cup holders, and a little storage space here, which is nice and felt for your, your valuables, and that's about it for practicality in the back seat. Now, as far as boot space in the back goes, look, it's okay, it's not the smallest in the class, it's not the biggest in this class, plus the seats fold flat, so that certainly helps. And this being a top spec HS, it has a powered tailgate, but it's powered by electricity, and things that are powered by electricity in this car can have some issues, which we'll get to soon. Now, obviously what stuff you get is going to vary on the trim spec and eventually on the year model as well, but one thing that they all have, and it's bloody annoying, is the fact that you've got to control your air conditioning operations via the touch screen. Yes, there's a button here to turn it on, but it can be a bit slow and delayed, and just using a screen when you're on the move trying to find fan speed and temperature and direction of air, bloody annoying. MG, give us more buttons. But anyway, back to what you get. As far as the base spec model goes, you're gonna get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto via this touchscreen, Bluetooth, an okay sounding four speaker stereo, a reversing camera, air conditioning, and cloth trim. Outside, you're gonna get 17 inch alloys, LED tail and daytime running lights and keyless entry and start. But move up to a higher spec like this one and you're gonna get a slightly better sounding six speaker stereo. This leather effect upholstery, dual zone climate control, selectable drive modes, a 360 degree camera, and a whole bunch of other stuff but guys if you need to know all the specific details of what each of these get redriven.com check out the cheat sheet everything you need to know is there now as far as safety goes ANCAP did award the HS a five star rating back in 2019 but to give you an, an overview of what safety equipment you can expect we're going to cut to a mate of mine who's about he's about as English as an MG gets <laughs> ABS, 自适应巡航控制, 盲点监测, 弯道制动控制系统, 上坡辅助系统, 前方碰撞警示系统, 碰撞和行人回避控制系统, 以及后方交通警示系统. And again, guys, for the full breakdown of all the specifics when it comes to tech, equipment and safety, jump on redriven.com, check out that cheat sheet. Now we've said this before, but one of the more challenging aspects of making these videos is that when the car is a bit, let's be honest, boring, making certain elements of the video engaging. So to hopefully solve that, let's answer a few questions when it comes to driving these. Okay, so is it gutless? Well, no, it doesn't feel gutless. Like this is the 1.5 litre turbo front wheel drive platform. It's no performance car, obviously. It's not supposed to be a performance car, but yeah, it feels, feels fine. Like it keeps up with traffic on the freeway, no problem. Pulling into traffic or changing lanes is no drama at all. Again, it feels fine. But apparently the transmission is crap to use. Well, they were, and there are plenty of owners that still complain about, you know, how slow they are to use and a bit clunky here and there, but there have been software updates that have apparently fixed them. In this particular car, 
it's fine. Like it does all the dual clutch kind of stuff. It's a little bit slow on the uptake, but it's not, it's not bad. The trick is driving it smoothly. If you just, you know, plant your foot and expect, you know, power to come on instantly, that's not how dual clutches work. If you drive like a normal person and just be smooth with those inputs, it's fine. But I bet the ride and handling are just terrible. Actually, no. Look, it's not class leading by any means, but for who this car's targeted at, again, it just feels fine. It is a little floaty and kind of pitches and rolls just a little bit, but like the roads that this car's driven on all the time, like these ones, this bit's good, but normally these are terrible roads. It soaks up even like the worst conditions pretty bloody well. Yeah, but it doesn't feel good overall, does it? Look, it's certainly not, it's not overly impressive, but it certainly is not bad at all. Even sounds wise, like, okay, it's a bit of road noise, but it's not terrible. I was expecting there to be heaps of rattles and squeaks and noises, but there's not. It feels and sounds really, really tight. Look, I honestly, if you replace this badge with the badge of any other European car, like a, even a BMW, and gave it to a non-car person, I don't think they'd be able to tell the difference. Like, we, I think we expect far too much from this particular category of car. It's not a performance car. It's not a luxury car. It's just a medium-sized SUV. And what this is supposed to do, it still does after all these years and thousands of kilometers. It's fine. Look, as I mentioned, this is this owner's everyday driver. It gets driven on some bloody horrible roads here in the Hunter Valley. And I'll be honest, I was expecting, I was expecting it was gonna feel pretty rough and honestly crap, and it doesn't. It's not impressive, but it just does the job so, so bloody well. In saying that, there are a few little issues we need to talk about, but we'll get to that in a second. Okay, pricing here in Australia kicks off in the low $20,000 realm, which may seem like excellent value for money, although we haven't got into what goes wrong with them yet. And pricing tops out here in Australia around the $50,000 mark, which does seem honestly a bit too expensive, especially considering that we haven't gotten into what goes wrong with them yet. Something like this, a 2020 Essence in pretty good condition with a bit over 40,000 Ks on the clock, you're gonna be looking somewhere between 35 dollars and $40,000. Now, MG claims fuel consumption figures from as low as 1.7 litres per 100 k's for the hybrid models through to 9.5 litres per 100 k's for the 2 litre all-wheel drive models. This being the front-wheel drive 1.5 litre turbo is claimed at 7.3 litres per 100 k's, but this one's actually seeing 10.4. Now guys, before we get into what goes wrong with these, first of all, a massive shout out to Bob, our viewer, for lending us his HS. Bob, you're a bloody legend, mate. Thank you so much. Also, to everyone in the MG and HS communities that have helped us with the research for this, again, legends. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for, what goes wrong with these, let's start with the exterior. Now, first up, okay, this one isn't like a problem, more of an annoyance, really, but the sensors for the automatic wipers can be really inaccurate. So, for example, if it just starts sprinkling, sprinkling a little bit, the wipers can go off like crazy. There are a few reports that HS is fitted with a sunroof, just like this one. The sunroof can leak and it kind of drips down over the sun visors. Now, this one seems a bit more specific to 2022 models, but in really hot weather, the body control modules can freak out. Therefore, the windows don't go up and down and the mirrors don't fold in and out. And also, there are just a few sporadic reports of some quality issues. We're talking about, you know, panel gaps not lining up real well and plastic clips breaking, things like that. Not common, but there are complaints out there. Also, some owners have had some issues with the key fob, basically the car not recognizing it and not unlocking. Sometimes it can be just a low battery on the, you know, on the fob or within the car, which is weird because the cars aren't really that old. Sometimes it can just be other interference. Both times, annoying. Now inside, unfortunately, it seems that the HS is developing something of a reputation for electronic gremlins. Some owners have stated that sometimes the car just doesn't start on the first go and needs a second chance. Some other owners have reported incorrect error messages regarding the DCT transmission. Generally speaking, if you turn the car off and back on again, it kind of resets it and it fixes it, but it shouldn't happen in the first place. Okay, another one which isn't, it's not, it's not a common problem, but it's just an annoyance, real, it's a first world problem. There's so many bings and bongs and chimes. Heaps of owners have complained about this. You can adjust all that sort of stuff, but yeah, like if you open the door and the keys inside the car, bong, 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 just incessant, bloody annoying. Then there are some just build quality issues. There have been reports of owners like plugging their, you know, charger cable into a USB port and the USB port just falling into the center console somewhere. Not ideal. And even if the USB port itself doesn't fall into the abyss, apparently some owners have complained that Apple CarPlay and Android Auto just 
won't detect your phone in the first place. But then if you can connect your phone and it recognizes it, some of the operations can be really slow, you know, like push the screen, wait, then it operates. Other times the screen just turns off completely, which again requires you to turn the car off and back on again. Now guys, before we get into mechanically what can go wrong with these, if you haven't already, can you please hit those like, subscribe and bell buttons? It helps us grow, helps us make more of these videos for you. That would be bloody awesome. Thank you heaps. Okay, now mechanically, what goes wrong with the MGHS? I can't tell you because I'm not a qualified mechanic, but Jim is. The 1.5 litre petrol engine in these is from the General Motors SGE family. And you'll find them pairing a bunch of GM derived cars, Opals, Buicks and some Chev. A lot of their small cars use these engines. In terms of reliability, look early on whilst under warranty, yeah, pretty good. And they do have some oil consumption issues right from the start though. And they can have some issues further on with localized hotspots causing overheating. And they also have a few problems with the turbos and timing chains too. The two liter, it's a similar story. It too is a GM derived power plant. And again, in a bunch of cars globally, again, early on pretty good, but over 150,000 Ks, we're seeing piston complications. We're seeing timing chain issues and turbo failures across all variants. The hybrid version, it uses the 1.5 litre and maybe with a bit of luck having a bit of an electric motor there to help it, it might last a bit longer. I guess time will tell. Historically, these GM engines and engines in this family are fitted to relatively inexpensive cars. Therefore, quite often not very well cared for. The first few years out of warranty are likely to be totally fine but it's highly likely that the MGs and the engines in them are gonna follow in the footsteps of their predecessors. That is, very few of them are going to be around with more than 200,000 kilometers on them. And if they are and something serious goes wrong, it's highly likely that the cost of repair is going to be worth more than the value of the vehicle. Transmission wise, there are plenty of reports of slow shifting or harsh shifting or no shifting at all or no gear at all. Now, at the moment, they're all still under warranty, which is great, but that warranty is going to run out and the transmission, it too might be the problem that is the expensive repair that's worth more than the value of the car. Look, they are comparatively cheap cars and very rarely in automotive history does a cheap car turn out to be a good long-term reliable investment. Now guys, this might all sound like a lot of doom and gloom, but as the graphic showed before, these do come with a seven year warranty. So you'd like to think that any problems you're gonna have, MG will ho hopefully fix it. And through our research, we've found that MG are working really hard to resolve any of these issues. Although, MG can't perform miracles, and there are plenty of reports showing that some owners have been without their cars for weeks because of supply chain issues, meaning that a lot of MGs just can't get the spare parts that they require. This isn't an MG specific thing, this is happening across all brands, but just yeah, be aware of it. Okay, so after all of that, should you buy a used MG HS? <sighs> it's a tough one. Yes, the HS offers a great amount of equipment and features, especially in terms of safety, for the price. And while it's certainly not a class leader in any particular field, it's also nowhere near as bad as some on the internet may lead you to believe. Although... See, the concern is its long-term reliability, and that's something only time can tell. So if you plan on only having a HS for say the next four or five years, yeah, sure, why not, buy one. You'd like to think that any issues that the MG may have will be covered under warranty. And overall, for the majority of buyers out there, it's a decent enough car. It's not special, but it's fine. But if you're looking at keeping one of these for say longer than the next four or five years, We'd be very, very cautious. In fact, we'd probably be steering you towards something more like an older Toyota or a Mazda or a Kia or a Hyundai or a Honda. Look, obviously we can't predict the future, but we have a, have a sneaking suspicion that MGs and Chinese cars in general are just gonna get better and better. So guys, a question for you, would you buy an MG HS or a Chinese car in general, or are you gonna wait or yeah, what do you think? Let us know in the comments. See you next time. Claimed at 7.4 liters per one. Three. Three. <laughs> <laughs> Three, here we go. Does a cheap car turn out to be a good long-term something something? Common, but yeah, there, there are complaints like, oh, you bastard, it was so good until right at the end. Here we go, here we go. Canically, what can grow? Canically, what can grow? Grow, grash missions. Canically, what can go wrong with these? Look, I've just got a blank one I'm trying to say, F me. Um,